<laughs> Absolutely. Okay, we are a little late. I apologize for the late start, but I think we'll get going. It's Tuesday, January 4th, 2022, a little after 6. This meeting will be conducted via remote video and teleconference pursuant to 1 MRSA Section 403B2D and Section 6 of the Sanford City Council Rules of Procedure as amended and adopted August 3rd, 2021, reflecting recent recommendations of the U.S. CDC and adoption by the State of Maine CDC pertaining to the conduct of meetings indoors in the public space. Members of the public may join the meeting by phone by dialing 1-929-205-6099 using meeting ID 856-8334-0082 and password 642977 or via computer at the link provided on the city's website. We'll begin the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance led by Councillor Martell and I hope he asks, uh, as well as the moment of silence. Councillor Martell, I'm going to turn the meeting over to you. If everyone could else could please mute their computers. Thank you. Um, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please pause for a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Martel. Um, prior to me calling the roll, we will have 21-573-01, um, a ceremonial swearing in of Ann Hanselman and Becky Brink as Stanford City Council members pursuant to section 207 of the Stanford City Charter. And I think I'm gonna turn this over to Sue Cody. Can everybody hear me? Barry, you need to, can you turn your volume up a little, Sue? That better? It is. Or I can do this. Is this even That's better? Good. Yes. It's perfect. Okay. So I would, shall I do them individually, Mayor Mastracchio, or I could do them together? Together. together. Okay. So I will ask Becky Brink and Ann Hanselman, do you each reaffirm your oath to solemnly swear you will support the Constitution and obey the laws of the United States and of the state of Maine, and that in all respects you will observe the provisions of the Charter and ordinances of the City of Sanford and statutes of the state of Maine and faithfully discharge the duties of the office of city council. Yes. And I will take an I do or yes. I do. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I will call the roll. Councillor Brink. Yes. Councillor Martell. Present. Councillor Hanselman. Present. Councillor Tuttle is absent with notice. Councillor Stackpole. Present. Councillor Herlihy. Present. And I'm Ann Marie Mastracchio, the mayor of City of Stanford. We're joined this evening by City Buck, excuse me, Steve, Stephen Buck, the city manager, and Larissa Ricketts, the manager's executive assistant. Okay, first item on the agenda of the minutes, 22-6-01. Order to approve the minutes from the regular city council meeting held on Tuesday, December 21st, 2021. And I will ask for a motion to approve with the correction that the last, the, the, the minute should reflect that the Pledge of Allegiance was led by Councillor Lanigan at that meeting. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. Okay. Motion by, motion by Councillor Martel and a second by Councillor Stackpole. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will call the roll. Councillor Brink, I'm assuming you will abstain. You there? Yes, abstain. Okay, Councillor Martel? Yes. Councillor Hanselman? Yes. Councillor Stackpole? Yes. Councillor Herlihy? 
Yes. And I am also a yes. That is five in favor with one abstention. Um, 27-7-01, order to approve the minutes from the executive session of the city council held on Tuesday, December 21st, 2021. Do I have a motion to approve? Move to approve. Motion by Councillor Stackpole. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councillor Martell. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the roll. Councillor Brink? Abstain. Councillor Martell? Yes. Councillor Hanselman? Yes. Councillor Stackpole? Yes. Councillor Herlihy? Yes. And I am also a yes. That is five in favor with one abstention. Mayor's report, City Council subcommittee report. I will tell you that I don't, we didn't have any subcommittees. I have one letter that I'm going to read into the record. Um, it is from um, our former fire chief, Ray Parent. Uh, Dear Madam Mayor, please forgive the length of time I have taken to write this letter of appreciation to you for your help once again. The City of Sanford has stepped up several times to help us over the years with certain issues or projects concerning the cemetery. Only a few weeks before this, we had a, a burial plot ready for the next day, but rain overnight had filled it with water. Our cemetery supervisor went to buy a pump, but no hoses were available. Once again, Public Works stepped up and pumped out the water. The cemetery would not have been possible without the help of the city by donating the additional parcel of land needed to make the project viable. Ever since then, the city has been very supportive. For that, we are certainly grateful. All the people who have ventured into our cemetery have had only positive comments and surprise at what they see. Because of your support, this continues. Thank you, Raymond M. Parent, retired Sanford Fire Chief, board member of the Springvale Memorial Veterans Cemetery Board. And I just thought it was worth reading this to everyone. To What we do there is really appreciated by that board. And I had one other letter that I think other counselors may have received in their boxes. And I just want to say, if I receive letters that are not signed, I will not read them into the record. Um, I think if you have a complaint and you want to make it to me, I'm perfectly happy to entertain all of those complaints. But you really need to sign your name. That's all I have um, this evening. This this evening, so I'll tur I will say that there were no subcommittee reports that I'm aware of. Uh, so we will go on to the city manager's report. Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you. So a very brief report this evening. First item I wanted to report out on is the uh, uh, activity of the communications coordinator. First element is she has drafted uh, what we call what we're calling the in the know survey which will inform the communication strategy moving forward. What we're specifically looking for is what types of information does, does the public want to hear and how are they best hearing that information or how do they want to hear that information so we can do a better job of distributing it. So it's 20 questions currently. Um, it will be a, a survey monkey will be one of those major implementation pieces of it. So the, and, and then the, uh, the paper version of that uh, we will input into that so we can look at the analytical tools because we specifically specifically have designed this to be able to drill down and sort through the various layers of information as, as it pertains to a whole host of areas. So uh, I think it was a very well designed survey. We're still doing a few modifications to that um, and also getting a full subscription to SurveyMonkey so that we uh, can do the full tooling. Uh, keeping Facebook content relevant and scheduled. Uh, there is a, an extensive calendar out there uh, whereby the communications coordinator has, has that filled out as to what's going out and when. There is a posting schedule. There's dedicated blocks for each specific department to, to, for, to have their specific information go out. Uh, being schooled that the appropriate way to use social media is to not to inundate uh, the people receiving that, but to have that in a timed and, and uh, well-sorted fashion. Uh, there's also uh, uh, dedicated blocks of time for department-specific spe uh, uh, information as well as education. And there's been a, a starting uh, focus on human interest to, to gain followers for the various social media aspects uh, so as we can use that as a greater portal to be able to provide um, other focused information. Uh, creating an educational, so she's working on, she's actually completed these, but started the push on three educational pieces for the fire stations. 
January is Firefighter Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, initial graphics have been pushed out as far as firefighter cancer awareness, the whys and the stats, where it comes from and the whys. The next series will be focused around what and how Sanford addresses um, the whys and hows as far as firefighter cancer and where our deficiencies are, and that leads us into the third tier, which as it relates to the proposed future construction of two stations, hot, warm, and cold zones. So we're trying to educate the public so that when we move forward at a later period of time talking about fire stations, the terminology will be there, the familiarity with, if we're talking hot, cold, and warm uh, zones, uh, that familiarity will be there as well, the cancer awareness, because it's one of the primary uh, reasons uh, for building new stations. There's been an ongoing educational push as far as pay as you throw. Graphics have been put out there, uh, and information uh, around re-energizing the educational components of the why pay as you throw and how it works. Uh, the com com uh, community comparisons have been put out there initially, as well as what are the, the latest impacts on the program, especially as it relates to changes in the world of, um, of recycling costs associated with that. Continues to gather information on uh, website updates. Uh, she's seeking a new and modern format implementing best practices for public access. The survey will aid on where we place certain elements in there as well as uh, looking at the Google metrics there as to who's clicking what on what and where and how many clicks they're making to get it to get there so that we can better design the website around that. Um, seeking better control in-house and the ability to maintain the websites going forward and greater flexibility to manage. Currently, we're looking at four different vendors. Gov Office, that's our current vendor. Civic Plus, uh, that is the uh, vendor used by the City of Portland and other uh, municipalities. Granicus, the portal that we use for uh, management of the councilors' uh, information. Uh, we use Granicus uh, for uh, the development of the packets and such, and is pushed to you by iLegislate, another one of their products. They actually they do um, websites as well and a company called Revise. I'm less familiar with Revise. I have no familiarity with Granicus, but uh, the information is being gathered for future council consideration. An educational campaign has already been put out on the Notice of Property Tax Diversion Program, the new st state program that I, I gave you information on at the last meeting. She's pushed that information out as well. Uh, and today, just received information, and we'll do a push on the new laws as it pertains to gas detectors in multifamily units. We've also looked at, and this has been a huge success, I just can't uh, compliment our communications coordinator enough. So we just started last week. She, she caught her breath long enough to start coordinating with the Human Resources Department on job postings for our hardest to reach positions. Uh, amongst those are the various public works positions. We've had difficulty reaching that demographic before people that are, are interested. There's a response range and such under that. Uh, so there were four different postings out there uh, that produced 17 affirmative responses in less than five days. That is, that is a huge uh, gain for us. Uh, the assistant planner position, we've had uh, difficulties getting that position filled as well. Uh, so she's into the researching on the, under the best portals to get into the various universities, uh, putting on a, a handshake. I'm not familiar with that. LinkedIn and other social media, and as well as boosting the post to various uh, schools and colleges. Uh, rather than boosting Facebook posts, uh, they're actually purchasing them as ads. So she can target those in at, and, and narrow down the demographics and get to them more readily than just paying for a uh, boost. And also, we just started work on uh, pending incorporations of the new logos and the adap adaptations of that imagery that the Growth Council has put in, but the city has not yet adapted that into their uh, format. Council Educational Opportunity, uh, we received notice that there is a Zoom webinar on January 26th of this year. It is the newly elected officials workshop that is an extremely informative workshop for new and experienced counselors uh, to include uh, FOIA training as well. It's put on by the Maine Municipal Association's legal department. And the full details, we have those. And for those that are going to participate, the city uh, will take care of signing you up and, and making all of the arrangements. 
Um, let's see. Next to the last item, the Mineral Task Force. We held our seventh meeting on January 3rd last night. Uh, at that meeting, we presented the first draft of the new ordinance. was presented uh, and uh, reviewed by the task force. It was absent some of the administrative uh, uh, elements in there as far as the renewal uh, section, a uh, licensing and renewal sections. I apologize for the typos. This is very last minute. Uh, we focused on the new definitions. We focused on standards. That was that was a large bulk of the work, separating into prescriptive and non-prescriptive standards. I have I've asked the group because I'm highly focused on this, as far as putting in the specificity that the industry is is calling for that that is lacked in our current ordinance, and at the same time assuring that the industry has adequate methods and means to meet those. Uh, standards, whether they're prescriptive or non-prescriptive, allowing the industry the flexibility to address their unique situations without the city dictating an absolute way for which many of these standards must be met. Our next meeting is on January 10th uh, to continue the progress because we realize we're gonna, we've had difficulties over the holidays. We need to get back on pace and we're still on course for a draft recommendation for March of 2022. And the last element is we just recently met with the Northland Group, which is the Sanford Mill, uh, to address concerns around blight, homelessness, and security. Uh, I want to say that I was very, um, very pleased with the, with the meeting. The, the 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 response from the police department, administration from a planning and economic development response. Uh, I, I note that Northland was very pleased with the response as well. It was a great working uh, meeting. Um, they just wanted to make sure that their concerns uh, could be met as they're getting ready to make a significant multi-million dollar investment in the lower level yet again. So that's all I have to report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Any questions by counselors for the city manager? I don't see any hands up. So. Next item on the agenda are communications and presentations. There are none this evening. Public participation for items that are not on the agenda. Do I have, uh, I see Zenda, or is that you? That's me. You have a question? Uh, I wanted to say a few words, yes. Oh, all right then, go ahead. Um, I'm Zendel Bouchard. I'm a Sanford resident and I publish the Sanford Springville News. I wanted to say a few words in favor of accountability and transparency. Specifically, to ask for your consideration in recording the City Council subcommittee meetings and making them available to the public. I believe the reason they're not already made available is that they're work sessions at which no votes are taken. But while it's true no votes are taken, that doesn't mean decisions aren't being made. Decisions are being made that affect the residents and taxpayers of Sanford, as well as people who may live elsewhere but work or go to school in the city. Subcommittees have the power to decide what issues and what ordinances come before the full council for a vote. And because subcommittees develop these work products by consensus, that means that one or two counselors who happen to be on a certain subcommittee that's discussing a certain issue have the power to prevent something coming before the full council, even if the full council would be in favor of whatever they're discussing. We saw this recently with the overnight parking ordinance. Now, whether or not subcommittees should be run by consensus is a totally different topic. What I'm asking for tonight is just some transparency into the process and some accountability to the residents and taxpayers of Sanford these meetings are on Zoom, and while the Zoom meetings are open to the public, they're held on Tuesdays during the day when most people are not able to attend. So recording them and making them available for people to easily look at would um, provide greater transparency and accountability. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I see another hand up. Is that Chris Haywood? Do you have something to say this evening for an item that is about concerning something that is not on the agenda yes um i don't know um madam mayor um the sidewalks in sanford by the by the lifeworks building needs more shoveling thank you for that comment and i'm sure that the public works person is on here this evening and we'll hear that but um 
Okay, is there anybody else who has anything that they'd like to say this evening under public participation? I don't see any other hands up. I will go on to public hearings. There are none. Consent agenda, there are, there's nothing there. And we'll go to old business. 22-9-01, order to adopt the City of Stanford COVID-19 vaccination, testing, and face covering policy pursuant to OSHA Emergency Temporary Standard 29 CFR 1910.501D2. Steve, do you want to present this? I do. Well, I do and I don't. How's that, right? I wish we didn't well, have to deal with this. But, so I, right. There, there it is. But go ahead. <laughs> so um, on November... Uh, my goodness, wait a minute. Oh, okay. This is the OSHA standard. I, I'm so I apologize. I, I had a I was on the, the next policy. Okay. So on November fourth, OSHA issued an emergency temporary standard. There's been a long history on that. This was brought forward. I, I wrote the compliant policy to be compliant with that that emergency temporary standard. Maine has an agreement uh that um as a public employer, we are overseen by the Department of Labor. Department of Labor for the state of Maine adopts all OSHA standards. So the ETS standard will be adopted by the state of Maine Department of Labor. Therefore, we're encumbered by that. The city of Sanford is a 100 plus employer. Um, so the policy was drafted and it was developed on 11 uh, November 5th, uh, brought to the city council on November 9th at which time it was tabled because the 5th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals placed a stay on the ETS until the ruling on OSHA's authority to issue was determined. On December 17th, the 6th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals by a three-judge panel ruled to dissolve the 5th U.S. Circuit Court's stay on the OSHA ETS, and a new timeline was established. And by all legal accounts, the timeline is extremely aggressive, and it happened during the holidays, uh, so here it is. The new OSHA standard is uh, by January 10th, as a 100-person employer, we have to have an OSHA-compliant policy. That policy is contained in the packet tonight. Uh, and then, pursuant to that policy, by February 9th, we have to um, have assessed who in our employment uh, is vaccinated or unvaccinated. And for those employees that are unvaccinated, they must mask at work um, and to submit to a seven-day schedule of PCR testing and or proctored testing. That's accounted for in the policy. Um, and those the results must be tabulated each seven days to maintain compliance. I will note that that's coming before the U.S. Supreme Court next, uh, this, starting this week. Uh, and it's going to be heard again. And there are multiple other court appeals standing out there at the various uh, circuit court of appeals. So the, dispos the ultimate disposition of this ETS is still unknown. Uh, but that being said, I'm asking the city council to consider and uh, ultimately adopt the policy this evening so that uh, unless some other decision comes down, the city will be compliant for January 10th. We, we will continue to move forward for compliancy for February 9th. Um, so I've gone over the why it applies to municipalities. We've gone over that previously um, in the prior time date that was in there. Uh, the problem that I, I see in this now is that um, in, under the compliancy for this, employees um, need to submit proof of vaccination by January 4th. In order to be compliant for the June 10th, they needed to be fully vaccinated by December 29th. So there's some backlog there. Uh, we have uh, put put out the uh, requisite form uh, for the employee base. All employees have filled that out now, so we have that in-house. We have it in record. It's actually in a very large binder, a uh, very large binder, uh, with all of the proof of vaccinations and or non-proof of vaccinations. Um, employees are, are even putting it, they're, they're putting in their booster applications in there now because there's a three-tiered system now that we'll, we'll talk about here later this evening. 
Uh, so the city will support the employees for vaccination. We're mandated to uh, allow for a four-hour block of time off for them to receive their uh, vaccinations uh, over a two-shot series. So the policy is compliant with that. Uh, and the policy is also compliant with, <coughs> excuse me, that provides information as to where the employees um, who are not fully vaccinated can get vaccinated and it provides it within the policy for those employees that are unvaccinated for their seven day schedule, when they should be achieving uh, their testing dependent upon the day of week they start work for us and the submittal process that is in there. Uh, it provides that the employees who are not fully vaccinated uh, as of February 9th must fully mask while uh, in the workplace. And employees that choose not to be vaccinated against COVID-19 must present a current negative uh, COVID test each of seven days. I'd like to hit upon that for a moment. So I, I try not to acquiesce about my um, my difficulties with, with certain state or federal policies, but, but here is, is this piece. In the York County Emergency Management um, meeting that I participate in weekly, that's been ongoing for nearly two years now, um, both the York Hospital as well as the Maine Health Network, Mercy was not on uh, this, this particular week, they are both telling about the difficulties of testing. They are, already have diver diverted staff from vaccinations to testing, trying to meet the demand. They can't meet the current demand that's out there for testing, even before this employment piece uh, takes place. The week prior in the EMS um, meeting, Dr. Shaw was in there from the state CDC, and I asked Dr. Shaw specifically how it is that the uh, we as a 100 plus employer are gonna meet the requirements of the seven day testing period. He told me that we, we will lament together because the state hasn't figured out that avenue as well. I asked again if, if the state could ensure that we had adequate supply of the Binex now test so we can proctor test for this, we can reasonably keep up because we have learned in managing this that our greatest uh, assets towards managing the current COVID uh, impacts that we're dealing with is appropriate employee reporting on a timely basis and accurately reporting to us. Uh, we know their status. It allows us to do the contact tracing and we have adequate test supplies currently to keep up with that contact tracing and test them in or out of work in-house as a proctored exam. So absent uh, adequate supply of those, we will lose our ability to manage this and there currently is not enough testing capacity to keep up with this seven day requirement. So the testing protocol are, are called out in there. Uh, it, it will allow us for a PCR test, a rapid antigen, antigen test, and a rapid diagnostic test. In the policy, the employer is responsible for scheduling their own seven day period of testing, as well as uh, submitting the test results to us as the employer. Their ability and their locations here in the, organ in the city that are known currently are put into the policy for their reference and their ability to, to uh, schedule. I have put an emergency clause in the policy that if they schedule a test, because we've seen this, and the facility has to cancel out because they're, they're no different than anybody else, they, they lose their employment base because of uh, COVID or other reasons, then we will do an in-house proctored test. And we have confirmed that that is allowable under the ETS standards as long as it's proctored by a supervisor and an affidavit is signed off to that effect, that is an acceptable record of a, proc of a proctored test, and we can put that in the binder for that employee. Talked about the face coverings as well, uh, and then you have in your packet an 11-page uh, policy that covers all of those elements that I briefly discussed. Again, the city is uh, choosing under 29 uh, CFR 1910.501D2, to uh, allow for the non-vaccinated employees to mask while at work uh, and to be tested on a seven day cycle as opposed to mandating that all employees are fully vaccinated as a term and condition of remaining 
in employment. Now, we do have a sector of employees that are deemed public health. Uh, those are the individuals that are employed at the fire, uh, the fire stations uh, as firefighters, um, EMTs slash paramedics, and or anybody that works uh, inside of that workplace falls into that. Uh, and we have full compliancy as far as the uh, vaccination status of those individuals. Even as late as today, uh, the fire chiefs were in the conference. They seem to be changing the definition of fully vaccinated. It used to be, you know, the J&J &J shot or the um, two-shot series of Pfizer or Moderna. Um, the main EMS board has not put out their final ruling yet. That's slated for the 17th of, of uh, January, by my memory. Um, so they're continuing to evolve with the definition. I believe they're going to bring fully vaccinated. The definition is if you fall six months out of a, a Moderna or five months out of, of a uh, Pfizer that you have to have had your booster. And I don't believe the J&J &J, uh, outside of the two months, you would have to have a booster as well. The state is phasing J&J &J out. They're no longer ordering Johnson & Johnson. It's going to be down to the Pfizer and Moderna. So I offer all of those uh, elements in there. Uh, I'm fully satisfied that this is a compliant policy because it was it was uh, utilized the template that the federal CDC, uh, excuse me, federal uh, OSHA put out as the template. We reviewed the ADA uh, compliancy as well as the Title VII compliancy. So for the religious exemption um, and or medical exemption, we've built those provisions into the policy. It's been reviewed by a legal counsel, and we've got an affirmation on that. So can I answer any questions at this time? Um, Steve, I'm going to ask one second, Maura. I think I'll ask for a motion and a second from the council before we start questioning by the council. So do I have a motion to approve? Anybody? Move we approve. Second. Okay, a, mo a motion by Councillor Stackpole to approve and a second by Councillor Brink. Is that right? Okay. Yes. Now discussion by the council. Councillor Hurley, you have your hand up. Yes, I, I'm not sure why we're not Currently, I, I understand what the policy is written for us for written for a longer period of time, but I'm not I'm, I don't know why we wouldn't currently follow CDC recommendation and start masking within City Hall during this spike of Omicron and why we wouldn't make allowance for doing that um, quickly as an employer to protect not only our employees, but people coming in to do their business there. Community spread means that people are going about in the community and they're doing their business, which includes business at City Hall, and are catching it through that community connection. Um, so, you know, I would hate for employees to be sitting there all day long, get exposed, and because of the longevity that they're there, there's more of a chance that they can catch it, even from a vaccinated employee, um, so I don't know why we wouldn't make a recommendation to have full-time masking for all employees for, you know, God, I'm thinking at least a month because I think Omicron is supposed to spike and crash if it follows what happened in South Africa and other countries. I'm just, I'm throwing it out there. I think it's a good idea after what Portland, I wouldn't do what Portland did last night, uh, mandate it for other employers, but, you know, for our employment situation, you know, it would probably save us from people going out with, with uh, COVID. Okay, Steve, would you like to respond to that, please? I can. Uh, so that has not been our observation in managing the COVID uh, response. I mean, a typical day for me is uh, HR Director Howes reaching out starting at 6 a.m. in the morning as to uh, who, who has notified us of close contact and our positive status. Uh, the immediate drill down starts, the hot wash as to who close contacts were within the workplace uh, based upon the timing and such and that. Um, we have had uh, two, two occurrences, just two occurrences of actually documenting transfer of COVID inside of our workplace since this whole incident started. Um, one of which was um, our own... Uh, violations within our own policies that produce that uh, transfer, we've addressed that. Another was um, 
specific position that pursuant to that position had to do a transport of an individual that was not known. Everybody was masked, but was not known at that period of time of a of positive status. So it later became known, but we traced that down to the transfer happened at that point in time. Other than those two, all of our uh, investigative work in the, in, in the epidemic and pandemic policy, we have elements in there that we drill that down. And if we, uh, if we make a decision, if we can confirm that the transfer of the COVID status happened within the workplace, there's a difference as how that, that is treated as far as a use of accrued time versus the city paying that out and not, not having to use accrued time. Long-winded explanation for it's been happening in the community spread at home, in the home environment, or elsewhere, not within our work environment. Because even when the masking uh, mandate was lifted, both at the state level and the city level, for, for everyone, we maintained our social distancing, we maintained our occupancy load, we maintained our shielding, our cleaning protocols, uh, and such under that. And since that point in time, we've strengthened uh, the employee's notification to us. I want to commend the employment base for being very diligent on that at this point in time so that we can immediately mask up, test out, uh, and keep our employees in place as much as possible. So in following, I've, I've stayed consistent with my recommendations to the City Council as well as the amendment to these policies. If the state CDC or um, uh, U.S. CDC comes out with specific guidance, which there currently is not on masking uh, inside of the employment base. Other than that, I've always brought all of these elements to the council immediately, adopted our policies, including this OSHA pieces on the table now. Um, Councilor Martel, you have your hand up. Yeah, I have a couple of different things. Um, one is I was looking at the main department of labor um faq around COVID testing and basically they indicate that employers are responsible for paying for that time and for the tests so um that's something that's spelled out in this memo that says that the unvaccinated employers are responsible for their for getting the test um and it sounds like paying for the tests uh, as well as the time involved to do so. So um, I don't know if that's something you've looked at uh, or maybe can comment on, but if not, then I think we should we should consider looking into that. And um, I'd like to mirror some of Mara's comments around the masks is that, you know, if, if we're requiring one group to, to wear them, I, I think we should require everyone to wear them if there's concern that, you know, the, of spread. Um, so, I don't know if you have any comments around that. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, so the, the paid time to receive the vaccination is in, in as I earlier indicated, it is in this policy. That, that was a, that's a mandate within the OSHA rules. Uh, and it's been deemed that the, neither the state nor our local home rule authority can override the elements that are mandated within the OSHA ETS, if it stands the, in court of law. This is around the testing, not not vaccination. That is not a requirement under the ETS regulation that the employer pay for the testing or make make those provisions. That's that was specific within the ETS. There's no requirement for that. Okay. Well, the main Department of Labor website states that, so I think that that's something we should have our our lawyer look into to make sure that that's something we can do. And personally, I think that if it's an employer mandate to require a test, that we should be paying for it, along with the time required to do it. That's just my opinion. Um, any other questions by counselors? After, so, after, Steve, can I just can, oh, wait one second, Maura? Can I just, just say after, one thing about after Steve's comment? You know, I understand what he's saying, but. I feel like we should have something in there that that gives some authority to institute an overall mask requirement quickly. Because I actually think but we're. In, I think Omicron's different. But, I think it's going to be fast okay, and but furious, Laura, but it'll be over soon. Wait, wait. I was just going to say 
that that's probably not part of this policy. It's the next one that we're going to talk about. Okay. So if you want to discuss that kind of language, that's what I'm suggesting, that we discuss it at that point. And just for the record, <laughs> excuse me, I think um, we'll pay people for time off to um, get a vaccination. And I don't think I want to pay for people to get tested when they've chosen not to get a vaccination. So we could mandate vaccines. We haven't done that yet in Sanford. Only the so ones that, just, that we've had to. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, can I just, uh, to uh, Deputy Mayor Hurley's point, yes. So, so under the epidemic and pandemic policy, there is a delegated uh, piece of authority that that, that, that policy has get granted to me. That's why I made those immediate CDC changes. Uh, so if you want to account for that, that ability, the delegated ability in there as far as the masking, uh, absent CDC or, or U.S. CDC guidance, I would suggest that you make it in, in, that, in that policy. And then those elements in that policy uh, that have been approved by the council, those have been incorporated into this OSHA element. So when, we, when the OSHA piece in here um, stipulated that you have to provide for uh, how you, you know, how you get employees back in when they're allowed to come back into the workplace, when you mask them up, when you take them out, all of those elements uh, comes directly from the city's epidemic and pandemic policy as it's being asked for adoption tonight. Those new adopted elements for the employee uh, responsibilities are so incorporated in this OSHA policy tonight. These have been drafted multiple times <laughs> because of that, the, the, rap the rapidity of the change. Okay, is there any more discussion about this item? Seeing none, I'm gonna, we have a motion on the table, so I will call the roll. Does everybody understand that the motion, what the motion is? Do I see anybody with any confusion? I do not. So I will call Councilor Brink. Sorry, I keep forgetting to turn my mic back on. I'll okay. learn after a while. Yes. <laughs> uh, Councillor Martell. No. Councillor Hanselman. Yes. Councillor Stackpole. Yes. And to Councillor Brink, all you have to do is press your space bar. You'll temporarily unmute yourself and then lift your space bar back up and you'll be muted again. Because that works so well in Bob's old computer. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Bob. It was an easy one. <laughs> Councilor Council, Council Hurley. Yes. And I am also a yes. That is five in favor and one opposed. Motion passes. New business, 22-15-01. Ordered to elect a deputy mayor of the city council for 2022, pursuant to section 210 of the Sanford City Charter. Um, I, the, I will open nominations for the position of deputy mayor. I see a hand, Councillor Hanselman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I would like to nominate Councillor Maura Herlihy uh, as deputy mayor, if she's so willing to serve. Second. Is there, is, and the second, that was a motion by Councillor Hanselman to nominate uh, Councillor Herlihy and a second by Councillor Brink. Do I have that correct? Yes. Are there, are there any other nominations? Seeing none, I will close the nominations. I don't need to, we don't need to have a vote to close the nominations. Do we, Steve? No. Okay. All right. So the, the motion that is um, to elect uh, Council Herlihy as deputy mayor for 2022. We have a second for that motion. I will call the roll. Councilor Brink. Yes. Councillor Martell. Yes. Councillor Hanselman. Yes. Councillor Stackpole. Yes. Councillor Hurley. Yes, and I promised all my fellow councillors to try to keep the mayor in line. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I am also a yes. <laughs> and good luck with that one, Maura. Okay, so congratulations, Deputy Mayor Hurley. All right, 19-383-01, 
ordered to authorize a letter of support for Sanford's Thriving in Place Action Plan, which was constructed following guidelines for the AARP World Health Organization Network of Age-Friendly Communities. I think we have Robin Bibber and Thea Murphy here this evening to present. And I ask that you come and just give us a little bit of background, doesn't have to be a lot, and just explain what you want from the council this evening, because some of us were not on the council when you first came before them. Who's going to start? I will. Thank you. Um, and then, Thea, you can always jump in and um, get me back on track if I'm forgetting anything. So the background on this is in July of 2019, um, we started with a letter from then um, Mayor Tom Cody to support our work in trying to create what is now our action plan. Um, Thriving in Place started a bunch of years ago at York County Community Action under a Maine Health Access Foundation grant to provide services to our local seniors to help them stay at home. And over the last few years, this work has now transferred over to the Trafton Center and the Sanford Springvale YMCA and the Thriving in Place group is continuing under that umbrella so that we can keep doing our work. Um, so that's sort of the short background on what we're doing. Um, so the action plan comes out of doing um, some community pre-COVID uh, community group um, survey discussions. And then also we did a um, online and paper survey of local residents um, to inform what our work is. So that's how we've built out our action plan. I will say we're a little bit behind. COVID's gotten us a little bit behind, but with this letter of support, which renews the city's um, support for our group and the work that we're doing, we'll now have our, be able to submit our action plan to AARP and then be able to start working on the action plan. Um, and I know Thea quickly wanted to talk about a little bit about what some of that work was through, through our volunteer network. So I thought it would be great for you guys to hear a little piece of what we are doing apart from the action plan. Okay, so I guess it's me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, we meet monthly, uh, and there's five or six of us that are on the um, leadership committee. And one of the first things that we embarked on was to um, develop a resource guide. And we, we went through and looked at everything that is available to help seniors in our community, both um, legally, medically professionally, but also some recreational things. You know, we included the library, we included the Y, we included the hiking trails, um, opportunities for volunteering. And we've made this available to the different housing authorities. And I have personally gone to the Village View and am planning to visit Sunset Towers and the other um, Timber Ridge, wherever there's a group of people that wants to know what's out there, we're, we're going to go and visit. We also have a volunteer network. We um, are doing shoveling in the wintertime for seniors. We do yard cleanups, um, very small jobs um, in-house. We've put up storm doors. We've taken out air conditioners, that kind of thing. Um, whatever needs to happen to keep people comfortable in their homes and able to, to do what they would like to be doing, that's what this is about. It's grassroots. It's um, there's no charge to the seniors. Um, it's just it's just our way of trying to. And age friendly is not just seniors. Age friendly is young, old, you know, sidewalks, shoveling, whatever it takes. And that's what we're about. I will just sort of throw in there too that we're always looking for volunteers to be involved, not just in hopefully now the implementation of our action plan, but also to be um, volunteers within our volunteer network to help our local seniors. Um, we've been trying to mostly concentrate on outside activities because of COVID at some point, we hope to get back to being able, <laughs> we hope to get back to being able to do some of the things inside that we know that local seniors need to have done. So we're looking for support to update our letter and be able to then submit our action plan to um, the state office of AARP. 
Thank you, ladies. That was great. Um, I appreciate that. And I'm glad that um, Zendel Bouchard's on here this evening because I have a feeling she'll be really interested and probably write a great article about it. So I'm looking for a motion from counselor to approve and authorize this letter of support. Move we approve the letter of support. I have a motion from Councillor Stackpole. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councillor Martell. Any more discussion by the council? <clears throat> Seeing none, I'll call the roll. Councillor Brink? Yes. Councillor Martell? Yes. Councillor Hanselman? Yes. Councillor Stackpole? Yes. Deputy Mayor Hurley? Yes. And I am also a yes. That is unanimous of all those present. Thank you for coming this evening, ladies. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, 19-726-01. Ordered to authorize the city manager on behalf of the city treasurer to execute an agreement between Camden National Bank and the city of Stanford to extend our current banking service agreement for an additional year from March 1st, 2022 through February 28th, 2023. Who's gonna present on this this evening, Steve? I'll present on this this evening, please. Okay, So in, in your background, uh, there is the banking agreement that we currently have with, with uh, Camden National, formerly the Bank of Maine. Camden National bought out the Bank of Maine. Bank of Maine was, was founded by um, individuals who originally founded People's Heritage, which became TD Bank, TD Bank North, and, and all of those derivations. Um, it was awarded under an RF, a banking RFP uh, actually seven years ago. The original five-year proposal that was accepted by the city council uh, provided for two one-year extensions. Both of those one-year extensions have been exercised uh, uh, under, under our former treasurer. Current treasurer, Erin McMahon, she's, she's in the conference with us here this evening, is further recommending the extension of the banking services. Those recommendations come, come as, as follows. Uh, this would be a one-year extension that we're requesting. Uh, we recognize that the banking environment stands to change as interest rates are going to uh, are proposed to go up over the next year. But uh, in order to preserve the uh, very favorable deal that the city has currently, we're asking for this extension. Camden National is willing to extend for an additional year without ch any change of term, terms and services. We feel that this uh, it would be very unlikely uh, that we could preserve the city's favorable position that we have currently if we're putting this to bid uh, in this environment. During, the city currently has no monthly service fees and our checking accounts are interest bearing. That's extremely rare in this environment. The city did not and does not anticipate getting any institutions under a new bid that will support sub-accounting of our numerous accounts. We didn't achieve that even five years ago uh, at that point in time when the, the environment was more favorable. Uh, we use this, this service extensively uh, for a multitude of departments uh, in managing the various funds that are uh, associated with them. It would be a delay in services. The city receives ACH wires for most of our grants, Waste Zero, State of Maine, Rev Sharing, Betty Homestead, and school subsidies. Uh, we would experience operational delays. Likely the operational accounts include the school nutrition and adult education under that realm. The city currently is not restricted to a minimum balance preserving flexibility with the use of funds. If rates were to increase, we can continue to invest outside of Camden by an invitation to bid. That's a very, very favorable condition that we have in our banking relationship. Um, there's a concern of learning a new online platform for our school and city employees in this current environment. There's been a significant amount of personnel change over the last year and that we're still playing catch up, getting all of those elements in place and switching accounts and all of the names on those accounts at this point in time uh, would be very burdensome. Currently, Camden National has uh, two fairly local branches and a working relationship with our courier and branch employees that was identified uh, as options in the last RFP. Our current courier service we would lose by changing uh, banking services likely because those banks that responded uh, favorably before did, could not maintain that relationship. 
And Camden has also been extremely responsive and flexible during the pandemic. They allowed the city to use remote deposit and, and discontinuous use as restrictions were eased. Given these elements, the administration uh, is requesting that the council consider authorizing a one-year extension for banking services, preserving the current relationship for banking and allowing a future bid in what is anticipated to be a more competitive environment as interest rates are anticipated to rise over the next year. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm going to ask for a motion and a second before we have any discussion, if it's necessary. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Motion by Councilor Martell is, and a second by Councilor Martell. I mean, excuse me, Councilor Hanselman. Okay, any discussion by the council or questions for the city manager? Seeing none, then I'll call the roll. Councilor Brink? Yes. Councilor Martell? Yes. Councilor Hanselman? Yes. Councilor Stackpole? Yes. Deputy Mayor Herlihy? Yes. And I am also a yes. That is unanimous of all those present. Thank you. Okay, 22-8-01. Ordered to adopt the third amendment to the epidemic and pandemic policy incorporating new US CDC guidance to shorten the isolation and quarantine period for certain employees dependent upon vaccination and symptomatic status. Do we wanna uh, wait for a motion so you can just tell us what those are first, Steve, and then we'll see if anybody wants to amend it at all. Okay, so in the... Uh the council packet is, is a memo that I outlined for this uh, presentation. So on December 27th, the U.S. CDC issued new guidance uh, entitled CDC Updates and Shortens Recommended Isolation and Quarantine Period for General Population. A copy of that guidance is put here in the packet. Uh, it resulted in the third amendment to the pandemic policy as is being presented here this evening. Um, in, in making that reference, pursuant to the delegated authority in there, I have the authority to make these amendments pursuant to uh, new and or revised CDC guidance. So I made those uh, immediately on the 28th, put that out to the workforce, and then now bringing those forward for the uh, subsequent adoption by the city council at this meeting. CDC stated that the reasons for the changes in the guidance was that the majority of the SARS-CoV-2 transmissions occurs early in the course of illness, generally in the one to two days, one to two days prior to the onset of symptoms, and the two to three days thereafter. I highlighted this in, in yellow here for this, this evening because I fail to find where the seven-day testing cycle is going to help us better manage what we're already managing under this one to two days prior and the two to three days thereafter. Methodologies and the means that we have in place for the employees giving us immediate notification of well-recognized symptoms uh, and or that they've been in contact with somebody that has tested positive or is reasonably suspected to be COVID positive has really been in the heart of what it, what it is that we do with our rapid testing masking of those employees and, and testing them out. But the key changes uh, are this, that the presumed or confirmed COVID-19 positive isolation period changes from the prior 10 days to now five. That is shortened. <clears throat> that is significant to us as an employer in getting people back into the workplace. They have to, they have to further mask uh, for the five days upon return but they can only return after the five days if they're asymptomatic uh, and meet the other requirements that are in the policy. The U.S. CDC has now created, and we recognize that in the amendments to the policy, that there's basically three categories now. There's a vaccinated less than six months and or boosted. There's a vaccinated in over six months and not yet boosted. Then there is a category of the unvaccinated. So the policy recognizes the differences between all of those. Um, Dr. Schmidt in today's EMA uh, conference spoke extensively about his observations inside of the main health network. York Hospital affirmed his observations that the, the greatest value for working against the pandemic right now is being boosted. 
you're, you're, if you're in a Moderna situation, you've had the two shots of Moderna and you've, you're uh, greater than six months out of that, the emphasis has been, please go get boosted. Because of the observations that the physicians are seeing of who's hospitalized and of that population that is hospitalized, 75% of those that are hospitalized that, that are in an ICU uh, have not been boosted. Right? So he, he's bringing his own observations in there of uh, the prevalence and the, the need to be boosted. So, Steve, you're saying 75% of the vaccinated who are there are unboosted, or is it? No, 70, 75% of the patients that are in the hospital that are, are in the ICU. Are either not vaccinated or not boosted. Correct. Okay, thank right. you. They're, they're, right. I'm seeing from our own, and, and I can, I can, yes, I can, I can discuss that with you. Just, just the numbers, the percentages, and such. What I'm seeing in our own employment base, so I can put some relevance to this for us. Then you have this category of vaccinated over six months and not yet boosted, uh, and then you have those that are unvaccinated. So in conjunction with the new guidance, uh, I preserve the city's recognition and utilization of testing to retain employees subject to close contact who are vaccinated if, asymp if asymptomatic, masking at work, testing between days three and five. That has been the heart of our strategy. So you notify us that you've had close contact, you are asymp asymptomatic at that point. Uh, but you're fully vaccinated. We mask you up. You stay at work. We test you, proctor test you on day between days three and five. That's the incubation period. Uh, and if you're testing negative at that point in time, you can unmask and continue. If you become asymptomatic or you test uh, positive, we're placing you out for the five-day period as is, pre as is now uh, subscribed, and you can't return to work until after day five asymptomatic and meeting the other requirements in the mass for five additional days. Uh, so I included a red line of the employee responsibilities. That is the section that has changed pursuant to this new guidance. The, the remainder of the extensive policy remains the same. Um, so in there I have the red line uh, that goes through all of those changes that incorporates the new CDC guidance. And I've got this reviewed. It's been deemed as being compliant with the new guidance in there. Uh, and I've worked with uh, our director of human resources, Stacy Howes, that I, I can't compliment her efforts enough. Her, her uh, days, nights, and weekends are consumed by managing uh, the employment base that we have here uh, with all of these elements. So in here, you can see uh, this is the heart of the new amendments, the exposure to contact. Uh, if you uh, fully vaccinated and you've been boosted, or you've completed the primary series of Pfizer and Moderna within six months, or you've had your J&J &J within two months, and please note that the state is no longer ordering J&J. &J. They will allow the utilization of what we have still in inventory, but the state is no longer going to pull new inventories of J&J &J in. It's going to be reliant on the uh, Pfizer and Moderna. So if you fall, fall in this three, this is one of the three categories three elements in there, but uh, you wear a face mask in the work, workplace for three days after exposure. Uh, you're asymptomatic. There's no need to quarantine. You test at day three to five. We do a proctor test internally. If you're negative, you can remove your mask and continue to work. If you're positive, you're out for the five days. Um, and then when meeting the asymptomatic uh, qualifications, you can return to work, and continue to mask up for five additional days while at work. You're vaccinated and not and not boosted. Uh, it's not significantly different, other than you're you're likely going to get into the five-day quarantine period much more rapidly, um, uh, or uh, being able to be allowed to return. If you're unvaccinated, you've had the close contact. You're automatically out for the five days. Uh, <clears throat> if you're asymp asymptomatic, uh, you can mask within the workplace a test on day five to get you back uh, if, you're, uh, if you're asymptomatic. If you're symptomatic, you're staying up for the five and masking for the five on return. That is the new guidance that's in here. 
We also now recognize that there's problems with doing a proctor test internally for employees who have tested positive in the last 90-day period. Uh, you will not be tested, uh, and if you're asymptomatic, you will quarantine for the five-day period. If, if you catch it on a, for a second round, we have not seen that as of yet, but there's stranger things have happened. Uh, and then again, you can return to work if you're asymptomatic for 24 hours, but mask within the five days. Uh, then there's the recognition that the um, if it's on-the-job exposure, I was able to d eliminate all of these other prior moving parts in here and, and simplify this. So if it's determined that you have a close contact exposure or contracting the virus at work, and a workplace exposure is determined after investigation by the, by the department manager and human resource director or by the city's workers, workers' compensation insurer, comma, the city will not require the use of accrued benefits during the five-day period of being placed out of work and will pay for the lost time or supplement to workers' compensation according to either the personnel policy or the collective bargaining agreement. Uh, so after day seven, the income protection policy will pick it up and not until after day um, <clears throat> 14 does the workers' comp pick that up. We will address that. We'll make the employee whole. So either one of those pick up. If, it, if it's... Um, if those pick up, it's, it's, it's an extensive case. We've had that only on one, one circumstance in the last uh, year and a well, year and what? Year and 10 months now, uh, we've had one occurrence of that. We've stricken out all of the prior uh, qualifications because those categories have been eliminated. We've retained the return to work elements in there as far as the employees' responsibilities. That really has not changed pursuant to the new CDC guidance. And it's recognized that the uh, administration will work with the local and state health officials to manage the epidemic and pandemic, that the council in consultation with the manager will have the ability to make decisions which impact the city's services during a pandemic. So that's the end of the amendments that will go into the epidemic and pandemic policy, either approved as presented or approved with your amendments here this evening. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, Steve, could you just address the issue that um, the deputy mayor was discussing, the ability, so should, should you decide that there's this all of a sudden a spike and you really think everybody should um, mask up, including people walking into City Hall? We want to keep business going in the city. Um, do you have that ability? Um, right now, the delegated authority uh, that I have to make these changes is dependent upon changes in the CDC, either the state or federal guidance. Um, <clears throat> uh, just I'm looking for the section in here. Let me, let me stop share for a moment so I can ex uh, expand this and I'll, I'll pull the section up. Are you there, Steve? Yes, I'm just I'm just looking through the policy here. Just, oh, okay. Just oh, all right. For a minute, I thought you were frozen. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought it was me. So, um, Deputy yeah, Mayor, okay, Hurley, I, I go ahead. Here. So, well, what is, I guess what I'm looking for, see, I actually think we're getting to the close to the point of it's going to be too late. But, I mean, as you read that, you're, you know, you're talking about how people, if they get workplace um, exposure, they can um, use... Um, uh, anyway, it's on the city's dime. But um, so my thought process is there, COVID is, the Omicron is different. It's spreading very quickly. It's, um, you can be further apart and get it. 
Uh, they've talked about cases where people were living in hotel rooms across the hall from each other in, in um, COVID uh, hotels, like in Hong Kong or something. And just because they were receiving their meal for the day through the door, they happened to have their door open at the exact same moment. One person across the street infected another person across the hall and they could prove it based on the, um, the, the, the metrics of looking at both of their um, COVID cases. And so they've proven that that's how the person who was uninfected actually got infected. And so it seems like during the next month, it would be at the it would be wise for everybody to be masking. And so what would give you that authority? I, th I think we should be masking as of yesterday, actually, at least for a month. So, it makes sense. So right now, here's I highlighted in blue the, the area in the policy. So the city council shall hereby delegate the authority to the city manager to amend this policy expeditiously in any area addressing exposure to the virus to the virus as dictated by either the CDC or the main CDC as an advisory or changed practices. Well, that's what I relied upon. That's what I relied upon when the, the federal CDC changed the quarantine period on the 27th. I immediately amended this on the 28th and pushed it forward. But I, you know, I can't. I'm, I'm not. I'm not uh, arguing uh, the masking element. I just can't put my finger right. That I, I don't have anything for guidance that puts my finger on that. Um, make these changes under the policy. Okay. Even though the current recommendation is, is that. Beg your pardon. The current recommendation is everybody mask inside. I know it's only a recommendation from the CDC, but it is the current recommendation. But they haven't incorporated that in, into the guidance yet. That, so that's 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 what I rely upon when they incorporate it in the guidance. Okay, Council. Not, I'm not arguing the value. I'm just I'm just you know I'm just staying the course as far as what what's been delegated in my realm. You can delegate further. You can make you can make changes to the epidemic and pandemic policy, and or give me authority to implement. Uh, in, a, in a particular direction at, at a given juncture in time. I would take out that if you get pa impacted at work, then it's, you know, kind of you get to use, <laughs> I'm sure everybody would mask up then. It's like, where's the harm to them if they get impacted at work, other than lost work for us? Okay, Councillor Hanselman, I'm going to go to other questions. Hang on. Thank you. Well, and, and just Deputy Mayor, in response to your last comment, I'd say the impact is feeling really cruddy, speaking from personal experience. So um, it's not without impact, certainly. Um, I personally struggle with the idea of um, instituting a mask policy for our city staff. Um, and we have to think a little bit about it, but I was more concerned along the lines of, of Deputy Mayor, what you're saying is the concern about our city staff that are forward facing and seeing so much traffic in City Hall, you know, do they feel protected enough? So my concern was more from the standpoint of, do they feel like they need additional precautions for people visiting City Hall so that they feel um, just protected? Um, you know, so that, that was my, my concern along the lines of what you're saying, um, less so, thinking about trying to ask staff to mask up, but I, I do hear what you're saying with Omicron being very different. Um, so that's just a comment. I guess my question is in regards to the masks themselves, we've heard Dr. Shaw as well as others talking a lot about the type of masks that we're using right now. And so within our policy, I can't remember if we define anywhere what a mask is, Steve. Um, I know gators were being used within our PD at one point. Um, you know, I know I have a lot of cute cloth masks that I was using prior to getting the recommendation to, to use a KN95. Um, is that something that we could make better masks available to staff? It, it, assuming we don't want to put it into our policy, at least have them available um, for folks. As muted, we have available PPE as far as the, the uh, I'll call them the surgical type of masks are concerned. We have those available. Uh, most of the employees have a preference of wearing the cloth masks. It may look more stylish and such under that. Um, so there, there's those elements. Uh, our medical providers, our healthcare providers, do wear the N95s uh, when they're outside of the, the station and performing patient care, and they wear the uh, surgical masks for other other elements. Councillor Stackpole has a question. 
Yeah, uh, Steve, once again, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, uh, asking if you were given, um, if you were delegated this authority by the council, are, are you comfortable making that decision without any state or uh, federal guidance on it? I would be comfortable if we could we, if we could correlate uh, a positive response to the to the masking of of our employees and and not everybody else. You know that that's that's the piece there. Um, I, I I'm sorry. Uh, so you're talking about masking employees, but not not uh, mandating masking people coming into city hall, for instance. Is that am I understanding you right? No, so I, I, I guess I'm not clear if, if you're suggesting that all employees in City Hall be, be masked for the duration of the work period as well as individuals entering uh, the building, because we had that when the city had a uh, citywide mask mandate uh, as well as the state had a mask mandate. And when those two elements were lifted, that's when we lifted that internally, but we kept all of our other social distancing, our occupancy loads, and other protective measures in place. Okay. Um, well, I, you know, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm going to take that as a, as a yes, uh, because I, I don't know that if we give you, if we delegate this authority to you, I would think that it would come uh, kind of a, as kind of a blanket, but um, I, I hear, I hear what you're saying. Um, okay. I, I'm all set for the moment. Thank you. Councilor Martell. Yeah, I had a I had a couple of quick questions. Um, so one of the, one of the things was around uh, no tests. If somebody's tested positive in the last ninety days, how does that work with the weekly required testing um, in the other thing we just voted on? That's a very good question. That's not addressed in the ETS. Okay. Um, nowhere to then, be found. Okay. Yeah, that's a definitely an issue. And then um, I would also like to see if we have any one particular group um, that we're requiring to be masked. Um, I think there has been enough data that's showing that even even partially or vaccinated and boosted people um, are still able to spread at least this Omicron variant. Um, so I think it makes sense to make that a blanket um, across the board if we're going to make any any particular employees wear it. Right now, uh, the employees that are required to mask in the workplace are those that have experienced a close contact. They make us aware of that. They mask up and then they're tested out and or tested out of work uh, in the three to five day period. Uh, depending on whether they're vaccinated or unvaccinated. If they're unvaccinated, they're out for the five days and return after being asymptomatic for 24 hours and the other requirements. Um, I don't know if it's, it's, if it's helpful, but at this point, so I'm, I'm looking at, we implemented in the first phase of the OSHA ETS, we implemented the, um, the employee form portion of that, and we had checked with legal that we can actually ask for and receive uh, their vaccination status as long as we're protecting that information. Uh, looking at our own employment base, i just give you a level of activity that we've been dealing with. When I look at the uh, cases starting on November 12th, that's, that's tied to, that's the first time that I had all of the stats in place as far as who's vaccinated, when they're boosted, if they're not boosted, and such and that. So st let's start on November 12th of 2021. Since that period of time through to today, and this will change by tomorrow morning, I guarantee that, we've had 22 known positive uh, diagnoses within the employment base. Uh, positive cases since 1024, 10 of those 22 have been uh, since 1024, so 1024 forward. So I'm, I was looking at that. Let's look at the holiday season, so Christmas Eve going forward. So 10 of those cases, which represents 45 and a half percent of those 22, happened from December 24th and/or later. 
I then went in and looked at uh, cases starting on 1-1 of 2022. We've had seven cases since January 1st. So that represents 31, 30, uh, 32% of that 22 overall. I then look at the category of fully vaccinated but have uh, had a positive test or breakthrough case. So from 11-12 to current, we've had 15 breakthrough cases or 68%. Vaccinated and boosted less than 14 days. So the booster is not, by the definition, has not fully taken effect. We've had two breakthrough cases representing 9%. Vaccinated and boosted over 14 days, we've had one case there, so that's representing 4.5% of the It's been a difficult thing to, to manage. And again, our strategy has been we've honed our skills. It's about the employee accurately and timely reporting close contacts, uh, accurately and timely reporting uh, symptoms, Mm -hmm. uh, getting themselves out of the workplace immediately, masking immediately, and uh, doing the appropriate testing inside of the incubation period. So so based on those breakthrough numbers, which I think you said was 68% in the last few months, um, I know this may not necessarily impact this particular memo here, but um, I know the previous one with regard to masking for only unvaccinated people, I, th I think that that maybe should be expanded further um, to everyone since we are seeing breakthrough cases. Now I can give you examples of, of employees that I know that have been more than diligent of masking, wearing double masks, wearing a respirator with a mask over that, and I can show you that those employees are now experiencing as a breakthrough case. Their efforts, their extensive efforts in masking did not make a difference in that. Okay. okay. But, just, we'll go, go back ahead, to you, Councilor Martel. Just, thank you. just a minute. Let me just get. So, ahead, yeah. So, so I, I guess, I guess we're in a situation. Part of what I'm hearing is uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We're, the existing uh, procedures are serving the employees well. Of course, we don't know about the general public at all. Um, but I'm also hearing Morris' comment of, you know, has the horse already left the barn here? Um, I'm just going to throw this out and say I'm, I'm a, 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 and I, I don't have a problem with with uh, more statement that it may be too late already. So if the council chooses to go in this direction, that would be fine with me. But I'm also wondering if uh, we shouldn't just take this uh, and if between conversations between the city manager and the mayor, there needs to be a, a quick emergency meeting to to pass something like this um, and not leave the, the city manager uh, on it on his own and I, I mean that respectfully making this decision on his own and uh, uh, with without potentially council support uh, if he did that on his own because it had been delegated to him um, I, I would prefer to see the council take emergency action <clears throat> or to take some action up front uh, here tonight can I just ask a question Bob are you suggesting that we ask that anybody that comes into um, a municipal building is um, masked under the guidelines that they were used before so that if they're alone in their office, they wouldn't have to wear their mask. But that includes people coming in to the city, to the city clerk's office to do business or into the planning office to do business. Yeah. I, I, my, my understanding is, I mean, let's just take a step back to what we were doing to prevent COVID uh, before we had the the reprieve here, um, and I do think Omicron is is different, uh, and it it uh, clearly if all you have to do is pick up the newspapers, uh, it's clearly moving very fast, um, you know, through our through the through the world, but uh, through our, through our community. I, I do think we have an obligation 
to keep our employees safe. And this is where I'm coming from. We need to keep our employees safe and we need to keep the public safe as much as we can. Uh, I, I, I'm not for going back to mask mandates for everything or as more so what they did in, uh, uh, in Portland. I would think I mentioned I was down in Philadelphia recently and in the city, I think New York City is the same way. You, you can't go into a restaurant without showing uh, proof of uh, vaccination. Um, you know, I, I took a photograph of it on my phone. And you want to go into uh, to a restaurant, you got to you got to show them your your uh, proof of vaccination. We're not in that situation here in Maine, and I think the guidelines from the from the state reflect that. Um, but I. I do think as a, as a council, we have an ob obligation to do what we can to keep people safe. Most people know how to deal with this. Now, as you say, there are people masking up on their own, employees, uh, people coming into City Hall. I'm sure there's a number of them that have, uh, are masking up without any kind of mandate. Uh, so again, we're back to uh, you know the people who... Uh, are exposed and and don't know that it's nobody's fault. They're just exposed. They don't know that, and then these things do uh, do spread around. So, uh, did I answer your question, Madam Mayor? Yes, yes, you did. I, okay. I so I guess I need to know where everybody else stands on this because um, is there a thought that we should amend this to require masking? at least as long as this surge is continuing with the, the Omicron. I, I would just, I'd suggest 30 days and then we have to renew it in 30 days or, or something like that, whatever's, whatever's appropriate. I think we did 90 days in the past. That might be extreme, but uh, something like 30 days and then we have to, and we can rescind it early or we can renew it in 30 days. I think that's similar to what we did in the past. Right. The, and this might be yeah. a separate, a separate, issue you know we may need to discuss well it might be a separate issue from this policy i'll leave that up to you okay and then the other issue that that is in my mind is is tied to that is the quality of the mask that at least our employees are wearing because i do think that that does have a lot to do with whether i mean there are some masks that's clearly saying that cloth masks are not as effective um, Councillor Hanselman has her hand up and then Councillor Martel. So Councillor Hanselman, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just wanted to circle back to Councillor Martel's comment or concern about the differentiation between masking and non-masking under the OSHA um, or the, the face covering vaccination testing policy we, we talked about earlier in the agenda. I just think it's really important to remember that that policy is structured around OSHA ETS. I don't think we want to monkey with it. So I think additional face covering like we're talking about should be separate and outside of that policy. That policy is really, um, and, and our city managers put a ton of time among other people into make sure, make sure, making sure that it's in line with that um, OSHA ETS requirement. So I, I just wanna mention that out loud that um, I don't think we should monkey, so to speak, with that particular policy. And if we look at anything, um, Council Martell wanna look at it separately. So I just wanted to say that out loud. And then in terms of um, uh, just a point of clarification, I guess that I'd wanna better understand is if we were moving forward, considering a um, city staff or city building uh, policy about masking, would that be all city, <coughs> excuse me, facilities? So including our fire police um, and so on, or would it be focused on city hall, which seems um, yeah, I, I, so I guess I guess I would want to better understand um, kind of the direction we would be heading in. And that is not clear to me because the most that we don't have any amendment proposed at this moment. So, Councilor Martel. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to the well, two things. I guess the the cloth masks um, have been really the only thing available to most people. Um, I don't know if you know this, but um, when all this stuff kicked off, the CDC basically said that um, you don't need masks and don't buy them. And then promptly the, <laughs> the powers of be cleaned out the supply chain of N95s. Um, and so cloth masks have been really the only thing available. Uh, I have seen a few N95s recently, but um, they haven't been widely, widely available until somewhat recently. Um, and going back to the data that 
Steve presented, um, it sounds like the masks aren't really all that effective at preventing um, breakthroughs. But um, if we are going to enforce a, even if it is coming from the CDC, uh, mandate that some group of people needs has to wear masks, then I think everyone should. Well, we already know there are some people that have to wear masks. So that's already, already a fact. If you're unvaccinated, you're wearing a mask. So um, let's see. I don't see any other um, questions from counselors. Steve, do you have something that you'd like to respond to, to some of the things you've heard or a suggestion? No, no, I've, I've presented the data as I know it, and I've presented the observations as I know it, and it's now for the council to make that, that decision as to whether you're going to amend the policy further or not. All right. Before I ask um, for a motion, is there someone who would like to amend the policy as presented this evening and make that motion? I don't see one. Anybody <sighs> put their hand up? Well I, I I don't I don't feel uh, I I would need more guidance in making the making the motion uh, and uh, you know go back to what I just said I mean I I think maybe we should just approve this as written but then revisit the issue as a separate issue um, but you know we don't want to wait till our next meeting to to act on this because then. Uh, I would say clearly, based on what we're saying, we, we would be uh, too late to the dance at that point. So, um, but but that's I would I would support or help craft any motion or amendment at this point. But I'm not I'm not really sure where to go with okay. it. So so okay, I have some other hands up. So let me wait, not more, just a second, because yeah. Councillor Martell had his hand up first, and then I'll go to you, and then to Councillor Brink. Okay, go ahead, so, Johnson. If I understand some of the concerns on the table is um, one kind of putting the, the responsibility on Steve to make a decision for kind of for the council, just because it's a shorter time frame. Um, I maybe we could make an amendment and I, I don't know if this is a good spot to propose it, but um, so that we could provide some latitude, but it would only be up until the next meeting where it could be voted on. If there was something that came up. Um, so that really only gives like a, a, a two week window and, you know, with the option of pulling an emergency meeting together if we needed to. Um, I, I don't, I think maybe we could put some language in there if that's a concern. Thanks, Jonathan. I really think that what Steve is recommending this evening is what he thinks is sufficient to, to address the issues in, in municipal buildings, wherever they are for our employees. So if there's an amendment that's going to be proposed, I think it's going to have to come from the council if we want to go further than what's in this um, proposed policy right now. Deputy Mayor Hurley. Um I, I guess the amendment that I would propose is that uh, the city manager, you know, be given the the ability to make town hall um, mandatory mask um, immediately, like when when he feels it's necessary. Because I mean, I understand he's trying to make this policy work. I'm, I'm a little worried that Omicron is going to kind of blow uh, blow up what's been happening. Um, and what's worked and what's the, how the management has worked thus far, I think it's going to blow it up. I think there's a potential that you'll get a spread in a blink of an eye. Um, maybe you won't, but there's a, I think there's a pretty good chance based on what's been happening. Um, that's why I would want, you know, him to be able to make the decision, signs go up, everybody's wearing a mask, and that the city council would, uh, without, our, without needing to come to us specifically, and it would hold until our next meeting. That's kind of what I'm looking for. I'm not trying to mandate masks tonight. I think the policy, I think he wants to support his policy and I understand that. Um, and I'm willing to go with it. I, I just, I'm worrying that Omicron is different than what he's been managing. And, and unfortunately that's what's been happening this entire time. It's you're just reacting and reacting and reacting to the changes. And, I, and I'm sympathetic to that. So 
but I just think people should be masking. If, if I were working in city hall, I'd be masking all day, especially in the town clerk's office. Councilor Brink. Um, I think we should probably pass this policy as it is, and then add another amendment, uh, another policy that just says, I, I like Bob's idea when he said, let's put something in for just 30 days and then reevaluate it next month. Um, that way we probably get past Obercon is very contagious during the first few days and you don't even know you have it. So to just say unvaccinated people, vaccinated people could also have it and spread it. So, and you won't even know you're sick and you're giving it to others. So if we're gonna put a policy in place, I would do it now for 30 days um, as Bob suggested, but pass this as is. So it's not even attached to this. Make it simple. Um, Councilor Hanselman. Thank you. I, I guess one of my concerns, and, and this has existed through the last, you know, since the pandemic's begun, is that some people within local government um, have been left to make decisions on their own, which I, I think can be a real burden. Um, so I hear what Deputy Mayor is saying about giving Steve the power to make a decision without federal or state CDC recommendations. So he can make a decision based on what he sees and react quickly. But I also fear that puts him out there I also don't want to put them out there alone responsible to make that. I would rather initiate an emergency meeting, which we've done in the past, which we could do, as I think Councilor Stackpole mentioned. Um, but it would take the burden off of our city manager to have to make that decision on his own. And we've, I, I've just seen in other communities and um, I, I just feel badly at times with leadership having to make decisions um, on their own that maybe should be group decisions. That's all. Just a thought. Thank you, Councilor Hanselman. I agree with you. It's our responsibility and um, we have to either do it or not do it, but it's our, and, and actually take a vote on it. So I'm kind of of the, of the, um, the thought that I, I agree with uh, Councilor Brink that we ought to just pass the policy first as written and then see if there's any, um, any appetite for an amendment that would maybe be, maybe require masking in municipal or, or workplaces um, for, a, for a, a, a limited period of time. So unless there are other people that would like to speak, let's just um, see what happens with the policy as written. Do I have a motion um, to um, approve the third amendment to this epidemic and pandemic policy that are presented this evening? Yes. So, no. Let uh, Councillor Brink, I'll take the second. Okay, motion by Councillor Brink, a second by Councillor Stackpole on the um, policy as written. <coughs> Any further discussion? I will call the roll. Councillor Brink. Yes. Councillor Martel. Yes. Councillor Hanselman. Yes. Councillor Stackpole. Yes. Deputy Mayor Herlihy. Yes. And I am also a yes. So that is unanimous of all those present. Now, is there anyone who's going to propose an amendment? I'm not going to propose an amendment. Uh, I would support an amendment, but I, I think that we should, um, as I stated earlier, in conversations with the mayor and city manager, have an emergency meeting. Should the situation arise, we need to move quickly. That would also give us, uh, as a group, including the city manager and other other city employees, the opportunity to craft an appropriate amendment. We talk about, is it just city hall? Should it be all municipal buildings? Um, what types of masks, et cetera, if we want to get into that, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Give us an opportunity to craft um, um, a, a motion or a policy amendment. <clears throat> to to move ahead, so I think that's that might be the best way to go. My opinion, Deputy Mayor Hurley. Although I believe the right thing to do this evening is to put in a mask mandate, I also don't think it's fair to not have the employees weigh in on a mask mandate. So um, I I agree with Bob in some respects. I think. Um, an emergency, but I, I do think the employees should have the opportunity to weigh in. They've had an opportunity to weigh on the entire policy. Um, I, I just, I just think that everybody's safer if for the next month where they're masking. Um, anyway, so 
that I don't know how Steve, uh, Steve tell- I would assume Steve would agree with that. He would want the employees to have some ability to weigh in because they've not been informed of this discussion. Uh, Councilor Brink, and then I'll let Steve speak, okay? I would agree with more uh, council, Councilperson Mora Hurley and Councilman uh, Stackpole that um, to wait, to have something, to have the, the, them write one and ask the employees and so it's ready to go. And then if we need an emergency meeting, do that. Steve. Yeah, so I, I, I understand the consensus that I believe is here. I can draft that uh, particular policy, and I, and I truly appreciate uh, you pausing on this to, to give the city employees a, a bit of input on this as, as it uh, likely will come forward. Um, I've, I've made very good grounds with the, with the employees as far as personal responsibility uh, and, and using personal responsibility inside the workplace. Where it all falls to pieces is outside of the workplace. Right. And, you know, you as counselors and me as your administrator, we only get to address inside the workplace during during their time of employment. I would just reiterate again, it's what what we have observed where the community spread is. It hasn't been inside of our facilities or in the, within the workplace. It's been outside of that and personal responsibility not being as acute outside of the workplace. But I can draft. Uh, uh, I can draft my understanding of this policy. I think it's an easy draft. As far as the public facilities, we had prior definitions for that. Public facilities. Uh, I'll put a couple of options in there as far as the type of mask and the duration, um, and perhaps if the council can think about triggering points to remove that element. You know, what what are the triggering points that allows that to be lifted off in a future point in time, uh, I can draft up the remainder. You know, thank you, Steve. I'm gonna just, before I call on, on the deputy mayor, I just wanna say that what I don't wanna have happen to us is that people who are working here are afraid to, t- to tell you that they're, they don't feel safe because there are people who sh- they, feel, they feel everybody should be masked. What happened at Portland Pie Company where people actually walked off the job because they just felt that administratively people weren't taking um, them seriously. And there, and we are putting, I, I want, I want us to continue our work here. So, um, I strongly, um, would recommend that if I was working in City Hall when I was around other people, I would be certainly wearing a mask all the time, um, regardless of my vaccination status and my booster status. So um, that I would ask that you, you know, let people know. I want people to feel free to be able to tell you that they're not, that they don't feel safe, that they feel like, you know, that maybe they would be more comfortable with everyone wearing a mask. Because I think that that is critical to the organization and that everybody's comfortable. Deputy Mayor Hurley. Yeah, and I'll I'll, re- I'll support you on that. I, I Just so Steve knows. Part of this comes from an employee and an employee's concern. So I think it's good that, you know, uh, people feel free to not feel judged for the opinion of thinking masks should be worn. Um, so, and the other thing I wanted to mention is I, I think that's important to ask them if they want to mandate um, visitors to City Hall have to wear masks because, you know, that is probably the bigger threat because they can't actually check vaccination cards um, or we're not asking them to. I don't, I would never ask them to put them in that position. But if they, if there's a mandatory mask because we don't want to check vaccination cards, that might also be something employees would be supporting, uh, would be supportive of for people visiting. All right. So if we decide to have an emergency meeting, you're all forewarned. All right, Steve, do you think we have to do anything else with this item? No, I, I, I have clear direction on this. I'll draft that up and have it prepared. Thank you. Okay, 22-14-01. Order to set a time and place for regular council meetings at least twice per month, pursuant to section 209 of the Stanford City Charter. Um, I think we're still on the second and... I'd like to make a motion that I mean, the regular... First- you want me to set the time? Yep, go ahead. Okay, I'd like to make it's a motion a- that we set the regular meetings for the second Tuesday 
no, sorry, the first Tuesday and the third Tuesday of each month, starting at 6 p.m., um, to be adjusted at, at future meetings as necessary for holidays and other issues. Is there a second? I will second that. All right, Steve, do we need to, anything else that's sufficient? That's sufficient. Then I will call the roll. Councilor Brink? Yes. Councilor Martell? Yes. Councilor Hanselman? Yes. Councilor Stackpole? Yes. Deputy Mayor Herlihy? Yes. And I am also yes. We did have a second on that, right? Yeah, that was me. Thank you. Oh, okay. Sorry. Had a momentary. It's okay. It's been a long day. <laughs> it has, actually. Okay. Ah, 22-2-01. Um, ordered to assign city councilors to various council subcommittees and as council representatives on other boards and committees. So I will just um, say that you've had these in front of you. Um, uh, Councilor Tuttle is not on this list right now. He is home recovering from being in the hospital and hopefully will be joining us soon. And once he's there, I may be taking people off committees and inserting Councilor Tuttle into them. But for now, this is this is the list. I tried to give everybody something that they wanted. And I just, the only um, thing that might be a surprise to anyone is that I have asked Councilor Hanselman to serve on the Sanford Regional Economic Growth Council Board of Directors as my designee. I think that um, she has a, a, a real interest in this and um, having been involved with the downtown committee, have two businesses, I'm just thrilled that she um, has agreed to do this. I think she's the best representative from the council. So other than that, unless somebody has um, a question or an issue, I will um, ask for approval and a motion. Move we approve. Motion by Councillor Stackpole. Is there a second? Second. Second, second by um, Councillor Brink. Any more discussion? I'll call the roll. Councillor Brink? Yes. Councillor Martell? Yes. Councillor Hanselman? Yes. Councillor, I thought you were going to say no. Councillor Stackpole? Yes. Deputy Mayor Hurley? Yes. And I am also a yes. That is unanimous of all those present. Thank you. Okay, next. Ordered 22-11-01. Uh, Ordered to make appointments to various boards and committees pursuant to Section 205.1 of the Sanford City Charter. I have this list in front of me. I will read it. Um, for the record, uh, the following applications have been received and nominated to fill vacancies on the various boards and committees. Airport Advisory Committee, David Caswell, an incumbent um, to serve till 12-31-2024. Linwood Dahl, incumbent, 12-31-2024. Jeffrey Howe, 12-31-2024. Board of Appeals, Mark Patterson is an incumbent, reappointed, 12-31-2024. James McCoy, 1231-2024. Fire Station Feasibility Working Group, which is a temporary committee. Mark Patterson has been asked to fill the citizen position that was vacated when Councilor Brink became, was elected to the City Council and became a council member on that committee. Land Bank Commission, uh, Timothy Dumont is the incumbent who was reappointed for a three-year term. Five. Actually, that's a five-year term. Planning Board, Tom Morgan, incumbent. 1231-2024, Recreation Advisory Board, Michael Perry, an incumbent, 1231-2022, Mo Calais, same date, Brendan Curley, 1231-2022. Um, Stanford Housing Authority Board of Commissioners, Kim Jagger Lachance, who's an incumbent, um, and George Little Jr., the incumbent tenant representative, both reappointed to serve till 1231-2024. And the Trails Development and Urban Forestry Committee, um, Katie Menende Hall, incumbent, Dolly Hutchins, incumbent, Hazen Carpenter, incumbent, Dave Parent, incumbent, Lawrence Furbish, incumbent, Tom Gagne, incumbent, Kevin McKeon, incumbent, 
Albert Alexander incumbent, and then Robert Mung, Jeff Wells, Sam Parody, and Al Pollard incumbents. And you will see that what we did was, I'm not sure if um, they realized this, but we had to assign different dates. So some of the, the first uh, four are going to be up in 1231-2022. The next ones in next four in 1231-2023. And the next four will be 1231-2024. Okay. Madam Mayor, and I just what? I thought the housing authority seats were five-year terms. I don't think so. I checked I with Diane years. Gary, and she said they are three-year terms. Okay. Yes, All right. Thank terms. you. And I just want to say oh. that the budget committee and council, both council and the citizen appointments, will be done at the next council meeting. So, do I have a motion to approve? So second. Okay, motion by Deputy Mayor Hurley and a second by Councilor Stackpole. Any more discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the roll. Councilor Brink? Yes. Councilor Martel? Yes. Councilor Hanselman? Yes. A Councilor Stackpole? Yes. Deputy Mayor Hurley? Yes. And I am also a yes. Thank you to all those that applied and have agreed to, to serve. Okay, 22-18-01. Order to set the annual compensation for the Sanford City Councilors pursuant to section 206.1 of the Sanford City Charter. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion that we set the compensation of 4,000 per year per counselor for 2022. Is second. there a second? Second. A second by, there's a motion by Deputy Mayor Hurley and a second by Councilor Stackpole. And I will just say that that is the same amount that it has always been since the town council was first, or town council became, became the city council. So it hasn't changed. Any discussion by the council? Seeing none, I'll call the roll. Councilor Brink? Yes. Councilor Martel? Yes. Councilor Hanselman? Yes. Councilor Stackpole? Yes. Deputy Mayor Herlihy? Yes. And I am also a yes. That is unanimous of all those present. Okay. 22-16-01. Order to set the annual compensation for the city mayor pursuant to section 305 of the Sanford City Charter. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion that we set the compensation for the mayor um, at a rate of 5000 per year for the year 2022. Second. Is there a second? Second by, all right, the, the deputy mayor made the motion and Councilor Stackpole seconded it. Any discussion by the council? Seeing none, I'll call the roll. Councilor Brink? Yes. Councilor Martel? Yes. Councilor Hanselman? Yes. Councilor Stackpole? Yes. Deputy Mayor Hurley? Yes. And I am also a yes. That is unanimous of all those present. Okay. Oh, Jesus. 22-12-01. Order to review and adopt the City Council Code of Conduct for 2022. Do I have a motion? Move we approve or adopt. A, a motion by Councilor Stackpole. Is there a second? Second. I'll second that. I'll give that one to Councillor Hanselman. Second. So is there going to be any discussion about this? I am assuming everybody read it. And if they had any, I mean, you can, it can be amended at any time. We're just adopting it now. And if you want to bring it back for um, discussion at a, at a future meeting, we can also do that. I don't see any hands up, so I'm going to assume everybody's happy with what it says. I will call the roll. Councilor Brink? Yes. Councilor Martel? Yes. Councilor Hanselman? Yes. Councilor Stackpole? Yes. Deputy Mayor Hurley? Yes. And I am also a yes. That is unanimous of all those present. Okay, 22-13-01. Order to review and adopt the City Council Rules of Procedure for 2022 pursuant to Section 213 of the Sanford City Charter. And before I ask for a motion, I'm going to just 
I'm assuming everybody read their backup. There was um, one addition to this, and it was on page, let me think, I found it. Actually printed it up. It's on, it's in section 41 on page um, 15, E, removal, suspension, or redesignation. I added um, a sentence for, for, for discussion. If a council member is unable to fulfill a committee assignment for a specific meeting, notification must be given to the mayor in advance of the meeting. The reason for this is um, occasionally what would happen is someone would send an email at eight o'clock at night to, the, to Larissa and I would not get that email because, you know, I, I often am, I will confess, ready for bed at eight o'clock. So I don't check my email at that point. And if I see it at seven o'clock in the morning, I don't have the opportunity at that point to get a, a replacement. So I'm asking that you let me know directly. You can text me. And that's what the purpose of this, this piece is so that I can uh, make sure that, that there's coverage. Discussion? Move we approve as amended. Second. Okay. A motion by Councilor Sackpole, a second by the Deputy Mayor. Is there any more discussion on this item? And I just want to bring everybody's attention that this has also was the first copy that came out, didn't have the um, end time of our meetings, which had been adjusted in October to 9.30, but I'm, I'm, I think this one does. So we're all set with everything. So I have a motion and a second. I will call the roll. Councillor Brink? Yes. Councillor Martell? Yes. Councillor Hanselman? Yes. Councillor Stackpole? Yes. Deputy Mayor Hurley? Yes. And I am also yes. Unanimous of all those present. Ah, we're at council member comments, guys. Okay, Councilor Brink, any comments this evening? Well, I would like to congratulate Councilor Hurley here. Now, what do I need to know what I need to call her now? The Deputy Mayor. <laughs> Deputy Mayor. Okay, I got it. <laughs> I'm sure you can think of a lot of other names. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know. Be good. Is that it, Becky? That's it. That? All righty. Uh, Councilor Martell, any comments this evening? I just wanted to uh, say that I hope everyone had a good, uh, good Christmas and New Year's and look forward to the upcoming year and all the, the challenges that we will face and uh, working together to work through them. So thank you. Councilor Hanselman. Uh, three quick things. First, appreciation to our uh, DPW and Highway Department for the handling of our first couple storms and ice of the season. Uh, very much appreciated. Um, second, welcome Councillor Brink officially uh, to the table. It's very exciting to have you here. And then the last thing is just a note that uh, Larissa Ricketts, the executive assistant to the city manager, is coming up about on a three-year anniversary, I think, because we started about the same time. And I just want to express uh, appreciation I have for how much work she does for the city council um, somehow in the midst of her very busy schedule in terms of keeping us um, you know in, in line well communicated with and uh, handling all of our communication so I'm just very appreciative of her role um, with us as a council so thank you Larissa. She does do a good job doesn't she? Councilor Stackpole. Yeah, I uh, want to say Happy New Year to uh, to everybody uh, and welcome to uh, uh, Councillor Brink um, and also a belated congratulations to Councillor Hanselman for uh, winning her election, uh, if I hadn't done that before. I, and uh, with regards to uh, masking, I, I'm I'm taking the approach that this is this is not a situation that's new to all of us. We all know what we need to do to protect ourselves and protect others. Uh, and uh, as I said, I think the council's responsibility is to protect the employees and protect the public as they engage uh, with, the, with the city. 
Uh, and, uh, we, you know, as a council, we'll continue to look at that. But it, it does come down to uh, good common sense, understanding what's going on. And it, once again, this is nothing new. We've been through it before. This is probably a more aggressive situation than we've been in before with regards to the, the spread of, of the virus. But uh, we know what to do. So let's just uh, do it and take care of ourselves and everybody else. Thank you, Councilor Stadpole. Deputy Mayor Hurley. Um, yes, thank you to my fellow councilors for your support this evening. I do appreciate it. Uh, all jokes aside, uh, John, I hope you enjoy zoning because that was my recommendation. I know you had mentioned it last year, and I told Amory I think I thought it would be the mayor that I thought it would be good for you to be on zoning. There's a there's a lot to learn on zoning, and I think it would be great to have you there with us. And um, Anne had her turn. I'm sure she was ready to give it up. <laughs> I think it'll be an think, interesting experience. <laughs> I think I think you'll I actually think it'll be good. It, it's a good it's a good way to kind of, you know, broaden it takes a couple of years to get into everything. And so zoning is a good one to sit on. Z um, zoning and, is the best committee, subcommittee on the council. <laughs> Come on now, let's let's admit it. That and solid a, waste can, are the most intriguing committees that uh, is, that we have. It's very technical and intriguing. I agree. And I think that, that that's really good for John because he's, you know, you're getting into more of um, some of the bigger things that we work on. Yeah. So I thought it would be good. Um, and just a quick, I'm speaking to Rotary on Thursday. Uh, just a quick warning to Steve. I've been calling a few of your department heads to get a little bit of updates on various items. I'm sure you don't mind. I'm not getting, it's getting out of turn, but um I have spoken with the fire chief. I'm hoping to speak with Allison tomorrow. And I've asked Matt because I, I don't, I hear what's going on, but sometimes I don't always take notes. So I'm just going to take a few notes and highlights and hopefully encourage them to actually have department heads come and speak in more detail for some of the bigger items that are occurring in our community. Cause I think it's good to inform um, anybody in, who is actively involved, whether they're, doing politics or whether they're doing service organizations, I think it's good for them to know what's happening in our town, in our city. So that's it for me this evening, Madam Mayor. Thank you. And I want to thank the Deputy Mayor for stepping in and agreeing to speak in front of Rotary. And if any other counselors would like to be on a list, if they get in touch with me and would like to speak to various groups, let me know because I'm happy to delegate that responsibility. <laughs> um, I have a, I have, um, a couple of things for counselors that I also want the public to know that council, council is doing on uh, January 25th, we're going to have a facilitated workshop, mostly about how uh, a self-evaluation and assessment that were required by our rules of procedure to do on an annual basis. And because of COVID, it didn't happen last year. So my um, goal is to make sure that as elected officials, that we get the education that we need to do our jobs properly. So that will happen on the 25th. And I think you heard the city manager discuss the May, that Maine Municipal has an elected um, uh, leaders workshop on the 26th. It's a Zoom meeting. Um, COVID once again stopped us from really being able to get that accomplished last year. We need to do it because the freedom of information um, is required um, education. That would be part of the main municipal um, Zoom workshop. So I'm asking everybody to, to, to let Larissa know for sure that you can attend this. You all got an email about it. I'll have Larissa send it out again. Please call her and confirm that you will attend because she will send um, the payment in. And if you don't sign in, then you, we won't be able to get a refund if you're unable to go. But I consider this probably the two meetings on the 25th and the 26th, important meetings for us as a council so that we can get our work done uh, in the most um, efficient way possible. So if you have any questions, please give me a call, but I am, I'm, 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 not, I'm stopping short of calling it mandatory but it's as mandatory as anything that I'm going to ask you to do. Okay, that's all I have. Um, future agenda. <coughs> Councilor Brink, do you have anything? No, not yet. Councilor Martell? Uh, nothing for tonight, thank you. Councilor Hanselman? Nothing tonight, thank you. Councilor Stackpole? Nothing, thank you. Deputy Mayor Hurley? I'm all set. And I'll just let everyone know that I am going to um, 
ask the city manager to have a discussion about the fact about the possibility of recording our subcommittee meetings, seeing if it's viable or, or something that we should do. Um, but we'll have that discussion. Um, just so you all know, um, if there's nothing else, then I will declare us adjourned and thank you all for your work this evening. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. 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 night.